Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our investment webinar. Glad to have you with us today. Shout out to everyone who's in lockdown, which I'm assuming is most of the audience that we've got on the call today, given that we've got Sydney, Melbourne, and all of New Zealand currently in lockdown, although hopefully for some of those places, not for too long, but I hope you're doing okay. Uh, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet in Australia today. Uh, for me at my home on the northern beaches in Sydney, that's uh, the Garingai people. Um, and kia ora to all of our New Zealand audience. We always get very strong representation from the other side of the Tasman, so thrilled to have you all with us today. Just a couple of housekeeping matters before we get started. We will have some polling today. They will pop up in your Zoom screen. So we'd love to get some input from you if you can help us out by responding to those questions. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end. So you can pop your questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A function within your Zoom screen. And we'll come back and pick these up um, at the end of the three presentations. This session is being recorded and we will send a replay out to you post the event uh, and it'll also come out within Mercer's client newsletter, so look out for that. Um, as you leave today, there will be a post webinar survey, just a couple of questions, one or two minutes of your time. Uh, we would love your feedback. Um, we really do take it into consideration when we're planning future events, so be uh, terrific if you could do that for us. Thank you. So just to introduce our speakers for today, uh, so firstly, I'm going to just take a little bit of a look back over what's been quite an extraordinary time for investment markets and then spend a few minutes also on looking forward to the where to from here. Uh, then we've got Dr. Harry Liam with us. Harry's our Director of Strategic Research and Head of Capital Markets in the Pacific. And Harry's going to take a little bit of a look at the role of defensive assets, particularly given where we are in the interest rate cycle. And then we've got Patty Brown with us. Patty's our Head of Real Estate for the Pacific, joining us from across the Tasman uh, in Auckland. And one of the things that we have heard as part of feedback from these sessions is that people want to get a little bit more under the hood of some of the asset classes. And so Patty's going to do that for us today and have a look at what's going on within the real estate markets. So um, let's get on to looking back a little bit over the financial year. And I will say for our New Zealand audience, I do realise that 30 June is not your financial year end. So forgive the terminology that I'm using here, but hopefully interesting uh, for you to look back at this point in time as well. Um, and I do think it's almost impossible to look at the financial year 2021 in isolation and without the context of uh, the financial year uh, 2020. Um, because really it's been quite a journey. And here you'll see the major equity markets uh, over the full two years to June this year. And of course, uh, characterised by that very sharp uh, drawdown that we saw during the COVID, COVID crisis in uh, the first quarter last year. But since then, it's almost, almost a distant memory, although many of us will never forget it, of course. Um, but markets have staged quite a remarkable recovery, and that's really been supported initially by the strength of the stimul stimulus that came through from governments and central banks to support the economies through the lockdown periods. Then, of course, the successful development and ongoing deployment of the vaccines, uh, and then, of course, the economic uh, reopening, supporting very strong bounce back in economic growth and uh, very strong GDP numbers. So some uh, remarkable returns with the MSCI world, if you were looking at any local currency, up 35% for the financial year. And even over the two-year period with the significant COVID crisis period in there, still 17% over the two years. So some quite extraordinary returns. Uh, the ASX over the financial year did uh, about 28.5%. Um, and in New Zealand, it was about 11%. Uh, percent. I think you can see here that clearly the Australian market is lagging uh, global markets um, over this two-year period, and that's really because we've got overexposure to some of the more cyclical sectors, which have been quite heavily hit through the lockdown periods, but also under-representation from some of those in-favour sectors like technology and healthcare. And I'm a little bit loath to bring in a rugby reference, but I'm sure our New Zealand audience uh, is quite 
happy that not only are you beating us on the rugby field, but uh, we've got the New Zealand share markets ahead of the Australian share markets over this time period. Uh, what the chart doesn't show here, though, is that there's also been uh, quite a lot of dispersion within markets with lots of uh, disparity in pricing, if you like, different companies, different sectors, different countries. And so cross-sectional dispersion in the markets over the last 12 months or since that COVID period has been higher than we've seen in more than a decade. And so that's been a very fertile time for alpha as managers have really looked to take advantage of the disruption that's been available and some of those uh, differential prices available in the market. So the median manager alpha, both in the local markets here as well as offshore, is sitting at around 2 to 3% over the 12-month period. And of course, that's adding to these market returns for active investors. So if we can just flick over to the next one, we'll see what this means for superannuation investors. And in short, it's resulted in a record year. Um, so what we're showing here is the super ratings default options survey, where you see the median investor getting just under 18% for the year. That is the single best year for superannuation investors since superannuation started and comes on the back, of course, of that strength coming through in the equity markets. Um, and it's more than made up for what was a very flat uh, financial year in 2020. And if we flick over onto the next one, you can see a similar story in New Zealand with uh, what we're showing here is the KiwiSaver survey for balanced uh, KiwiSaver investors. And again, a very strong return there of about 18%. And I think it's true both in Australia and New Zealand that asset allocation and specifically the level of exposure to listed equity markets has been the key differentiator for peer relative performance. Coming in perhaps second to that might be your currency hedging levels as we have had a lot of uh, strong appreciation of both the Australian and New Zealand dollars through that 12 month period. And that's meant that hedged investors have done better than unhedged. So the more, um, the higher your hedge ratio uh, or the lower exposure to foreign currency, that would have also been a contributor to peer relative performance. Um, of course, over the longer term here, both in Australia and New Zealand, uh, those returns for super superannuation invest investors are very healthy. So it's great to see that. So whilst it's nice to have a look back, um, we of course don't invest into the past, we invest into the future. So just a couple of minutes on how we're feeling about things from here. And the first thing as I'd say is I certainly wouldn't be extrapolating those supersized returns that we've had over the last 12 months forward for the next 12 months or really for the foreseeable future. We do think that that strong recovery phase in markets is largely behind us and it probably gets a little bit harder from here. But we do maintain a relatively positive outlook on that ongoing economic recovery story as production really picks up, businesses start to invest again. And that really leads to this virtuous cycle of economic growth and activity flowing in to the economy um, and ultimately should continue to support risk assets. So from here, we'd see lower returns, but still positive. And perhaps with more volatility as we navigate through many interrelated factors that are at play as we get through to the, the COVID new normal, if you like. So from a dynamic asset allocation perspective, we've paired back our um, what was a very strong, positive, favourable view on equity markets back to a more neutral position, meaning that we're keeping our allocations uh, to risk assets or growth assets relatively close to their strategic weights. Um, we also recognise that there is a lot of uncertainty around, and so there's a number of factors that we've got on watching brief, if we can flick over to the next slide. Firstly, of course, is the pandemic itself, and we are seeing um, implications kick in from the Delta variant. Of course, we feel that very acutely here in our region at the moment, and um, I'm sitting in Sydney, so very acutely, um, but also watching out for knock-on um, potential disruption around the world from the Delta variant or indeed future variants should they arise. Uh, secondly, there's much ongoing debate about the trajectory and level of inflation and what it might mean for the actions of central banks. So our base case is that inflation will be largely transitory as those COVID related supply and demand mismatches really start to make their way through and, and normalize and settle. Um, what's less certain 
is what where the level of inflation settles on the other side as some of these near-term effects dissipate. But of course, uh, strong and persistent inflation would certainly provide a challenge to equity markets if that was to eventuate. Uh, another thing that we're keeping an eye on, of course, economic growth uh, and GDP and how that uh, flows down into corporate earnings, um, particularly focusing here, I think, on wage growth as some of that uh, excess capacity that we've had in the labour market starts to get soaked up by that, um, the businesses reinvesting and pick, picking up productivity, potentially even leading to labour shortages, which could put upwards pressure on wages um, for the first time in a long time. And of course, uh, perhaps start to eat into company earnings. Uh, and finally, we've had uh, a lot of action coming through in China in terms of taking some uh, the, the policymakers taking regulatory action against the corporate sector, primarily in the areas of private education and the technology sectors. And that's put a bit of dent on investor confidence in China. And we've seen quite a significant sell off in that market. Uh, ultimately, so we'd, we'd see this, you know, um, resulting in some near term volatility that's likely to continue as China really looks to find its place in the capital markets and, and um, you know, achieve some of its own policy goals. Uh, but ultimately, I think we'd see as we look through to the future that these actions will improve the health and governance standards within the Chinese markets. It doesn't necessarily disrupt our long term growth story. Uh, but does remind us that if you're investing in China, you need to go in with, with eyes open and with a tolerance for pretty high tolerance for risk and volatility. Uh, we do have a paper on China coming out soon, by the way. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out for that one. I'm sure it'll come out in the newsletter as it gets published. So I've told you a little bit about what we're thinking. Um, be great to hear from you. So we're going to flick over now and ask you a bit of a polling question, if you can just respond to it in your Zoom screen. So the question is, markets have recovered very fast and some might say too fast. What's your best estimate of global equi equity returns and we'll keep it in base currency um, over the fun next financial year or let's call it the next 12 months. So you're feeling quite bullish uh, and you might be expecting that rebound to continue and returns of greater than 10%. Um, you're feeling positive, but a little bit more moderate on returns. So in that range of zero to 10%. Uh, maybe you're expecting that markets will correct from here. Um, so you're expecting a fall of somewhere between uh, up to 10% uh, or you're in the bubble camp and you're thinking the bubble is going to burst and so looking for a you know, significant drawdown greater than, than 10%. Uh, so we'll just give that a moment or two to see how the votes are coming in. Those, oh, there we go. Okay, terrific. All right, all right. So most people seem to be in a similar camp to where Merce is sitting at the moment where we're expecting positive but more moderate returns somewhere in the vicinity of zero to 10%. Terrific. Okay, with that, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to Harry, who's going to have a, a little bit of a discussion on defensive assets. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Kylie. All right, so as Kylie mentioned, we are in an interesting period, which we uh, refer to as uh, markets less unusual. Um, so basically, COVID has accelerated many trends, especially fiscal and monetary policy trends. And as you can see on the chart on the left, there has been a great debate about inflation. We know the transitory effects of the low base from last year, the inventory restocking, and also the pent up demand. And as Kylie mentioned, there's also this uh, debate about the, the uh, unemployment rate. And again, as I mentioned, um, government has also subsidized the employers and employees, basically leading to uh, the reduced bankruptcy rates and also the reduced unemployment rates. This is something to watch for. Now, on the right hand side, uh, we, if you look at bond markets, the bond markets are basically pricing in that central banks will not take much action despite the um, you know, increased uh, rising inflation. And that is, uh, again, because also the Fed has promised basically to look at average inflation, which is allowing for higher than their usual target. So this basically means that uh, most central banks are unlikely to take any action in the next few years and stay to close to zero policies. Um, even in New Zealand, and New Zealand was, I think is widely regarded as among the most hawkish central banks among developed markets. Yesterday, we framed from taking action also because of the uh, SNAP lockdown. Um, now for bond investors, 
this does mean that um, you know it's it's very unlikely that you meet any CPI plus type target. Um, so the question then is, what do you do as an investor? So um, as Kylie mentioned, uh, we are actually uh, positive on growth assets versus uh, defensive assets. But um, I, I think the most common question we get from clients is, uh, what do I do with my uh, defensive allocation or my you know, bond bucket? So we are uh, actually running a client survey. So that's finishing, that actually finished last Friday. We're getting the results soon. But among the respondents, uh, half of our clients is saying that they will reduce their bond allocation. And the other half is saying they'll maintain their bond allocation. So you might ask the question, you know, why would you keep bonds at all if you know that there is increased uh, credit risk and indices, duration has extended, and also uh, there is increased inflation risk. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so I think there are basically four reasons why investors still hold bonds. So obviously, if you're in insurance or defined benefit plans, you do it for liability hedging purposes. Um, if you're in a superannuation or defined contribution plan, you may want to use bonds as you, you know, the risk as you get, get older. And uh, there are also some people who think that uh, bonds are a good deflation or crisis hedge. So some folks think that we have not seen the bottom of interest rates and that rates could turn negative like they did in Europe or Japan. So in this case, bonds do have further room to appreciate. And finally, um, <clears throat> If you have like a longer time horizon, you know, upward sloping curves still exist in many countries. So you do get some reward for longer holding periods. But I think, you know, before you decide what to do with your bonds, you should basically think about what is it that I really want to get out of my defensive asset allocation? Do I want to be there because I want to diversify against equity risk because markets are pretty overvalued? Or is it because I want to enhance my income? because I'm now faced with uh, nothing or zero, 20 to 30 basis points of my bank deposits? Or is it because I don't like the inflation heading and where it's going? So um, we would actually like to ask you as an audience where your priority lies in terms of your defensive assets. So is it number one, income enhancement, number two, inflation hedging, or is it number three, diversification or protection against equity market corrections? So you can vote now. All right, so let's have a look at the results. Right, okay. <laughs> this is quite interesting. I had expected a bit more balance, but uh, maybe the, the trilemma is not really a trilemma. So most of you actually like to buy uh, you know, defensive assets because you want to protect against equity risk. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. So uh, earlier in the year, we actually did a, um, a poll uh, among our delegates among, and in our global investor forum. And we asked them, okay, let's say, you know, you don't want to hold bonds. What would be your preferred defensive asset? And uh, it turned out that, you know, based on the 400 votes, that most people actually voted real assets as their number one choice. And, and this is not surprising, of course, um, given that, um, um, well, well, number one, the Fed is the next speaker. And so we sort of knew the results, but also that, that the real assets offer inflation protection through, um, rental renewal agreements or, or tariff uh, formulas in, in infrastructure. And also they can offer equity diversification, especially in unlisted markets, um, as you run more asset specific risk as well. And also, as you know, the income of real assets compared to bond yields is, is still, that's still a wide gap. Now, if you look at the other stuff that people voted on, on the top five, you'll basically see uh, items such as private debt, uh, alternative types of fixed income like emerging market debt, high yield bank loans, anything with yield basically, and then also anything with uh, a more absolute return focus. So the first five basically tell me that um, investors are sort of taking steps away, you know, to reduce their uh, term and credit premium and, and trying to build up a basket of diversified risk premium through other means, right? So as you can see here, a mix of, I would say, a blurring of the lines between active and, and passive management, because a lot of these assets do require active management, and basically more of a focus on total returns uh, after after fees, you know, so real returns of inflation. Now, the second sort of uh, the bottom five assets, they are a bit more tricky to um, basically categorize, I say, 
But if you go back to the, uh, the trilemma, right? So if you go to the um, income dimension, you'll basically note that the um, bottom five assets here do not generate any income. In fact, you know, most of them do not have any cash flows associated with them, which makes them really hard to value. So that basically uh, means that, you know, the pricing is, is mainly um, reliant on supply and demand. And as we know, um, gold and commodities may be limited in supply, but like crypto or currency may have like more, it depends more on the algorithm or printing abilities. Uh, the second dimension is basically the uh, inflation hedging. So you could also ask, are those bottom five, you know, if they don't offer much income, any good in inflation hedging? So the other dimension. So this really depends. So on the type of inflation, I think. So gold may be a good hedge against, you know, unlimited printing by central banks or like modern monetary theory. Commodities may be a good hedge against like a 1970s type oil price shock or supply shock. Um, but in general, it will depend on the type of inflation. So it, if it's like a different type of asset inflation or wage inflation, then you may need another type of hedge. And on the final dimension, which is I think the most important one that people voted for today, the um, defensiveness against equity market corrections. So none of the bottom five assets actually offer any explicit hedge against equities, apart from options, put options, but then for the explicit hedge, you also pay an explicit cost. So in that sense, you know, in, normally it's, it's not something we recommend because it's like a drag on performance. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at uh, what our clients are using, so we do have some clients invested in gold. Uh, we don't have many cl any clients invested in commodities. And that is because there is a general preference to invest uh, if it commodities through commodity companies, because then you basically reduce the volatility and you get back your um, cash flows that, that you can actually discount and thereby put a value on your assets. Um, obviously, we do have clients uh, indirectly using currency as a uh, hedge for their overseas uh, shares exposure. So the Aussie dollar will fall with uh, equity market falls. And we also have some clients who use options. Again, mainly if they're like in, uh, they need to preserve capital for regulatory reasons or other. Um, and at the moment, we don't have any clients investing in crypto, but I'm sure some folks will have it on the personal side. So once again, uh, think about what you want to get out of your defensive assets. I think that's pretty clear from the survey. And then think about you know, the best possible assets uh, that you can put in and basically to get you know, diversify away from your traditional bond exposure. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Patty to discuss real estate. Over to you, Patty. Thank you, Harry, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's uh, it's hard, to, hard to imagine it's been uh, just over a year since I last spoke to you. Uh, we're back in lockdown again. Um, it's hard to remember though that uh, over that time, um, uh, we've had uh, intervals of absolute normality where everyone's been back in the offices again. It's been impossible to book uh, restaurants during the week. Shopping malls have been really, really busy. And you know, people have, everyone we seem to know uh, has been upgrading their houses or um, moving house and buying all the additional furniture and uh, items required for that. So you know, we, we have seen a very, very strong bounce back in real estate, but uh, we are back uh, in, a, in a lockdown conditions again, you know, which we are seeing major assets which are not being well utilized. But I think uh, the, the investment market has now very much taken a lead uh, from what, what, what they're seeing in other markets around the world in terms of the, the reopening trade. The fact that uh, the UK, the US, many parts of Europe uh, are now very much getting back to, to normality again. People are getting back into the offices, uh, people are um, getting on with their lives they're traveling again and i think a lot of the, the capital markets really are, are looking uh, beyond you know when everyone's vaccinated beyond lockdowns and seeing a lot more normality in the, the real estate markets globally what investors are, are focusing on principally is uh, the attractive income um, of of property uh, as harry just pointed out um, real, real assets do offer very very strong defensive characteristics and they also uh, deliver inflation sensitivity, so the ability for rent to, to rise, um, so you can capture that uh, that inflation um, in increased income on the assets, 
as well as the replacement cost of those assets, um, as we're seeing at the moment with supply chain um, bottlenecks, uh, building costs are going up very, very significantly. So that means the cost to develop new real estate is significantly higher than it was pre-COVID, um, which again provides um, some insurance uh, inflation protection and uh, protection to, to valuations. Um, transaction volumes, despite lockdowns, uh, despite the borders being closed into Australia and New Zealand, have bounced back very, very strongly. I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. Um, but some real, real themes have emerged uh, post-COVID. So logistics real estate uh, is red hot. Um, so that's really benefiting from everyone shopping online. So a massive increase in e-commerce, uh, but also supply chain bottlenecks. So suppliers keeping stock closer to, to market. Whereas retail uh, still has some headwinds, uh, particularly the, the large malls and they, these rolling lockdowns are, are really causing a lot of headaches to owners of, uh, of large shopping centres. We're actually seeing uh, office vacancies stabilising. So when I spoke to you back in May last year, I think uh, you know, we were seeing a lot of occupiers not knowing how they'd use their space going forward. But we're now seeing globally uh, a lot of major corporates are actually moving back into the office at least for two to three days per week and changing the way they occupy their space. But the office is remaining a major part of their um, workplace strategy. Next slide, please. And the slide here, we want to look at um, you know, the, the income component of real assets uh, and property in particular. So what you can see there across uh, office, retail and logistics, um, so the, the charts at the top of the, uh, of the lines at the top of each chart there, is that you've seen significant yield compression um, over the past 20 years in these asset classes. And that's been most pronounced in the logistics sector. So logistics cap rates are at an all time low. You know, they, they were the highest of the three sectors a few years back. Now logistics has been re-rated globally and is the most desirable real estate asset class globally at the moment. Investors are also focusing on the, the income of these, these asset classes. So if you look at the, uh, the bond rate and the, the red dotted line, uh, take, take away the, the, yield, the yield from the, um, the bond rate, the 10-year bond rate, you're getting a very, very high income spread from property. So again, that, that defensive characteristic of property, a lot of investors have seen uh, bonds, uh, bond pricing um, get very, very high, yields get very low, and they're looking for alternatives in real assets, including property screens very well for that. So the New Zealand numbers are, are very, very similar to these. New Zealand yields are actually higher uh, than Australians, but they've come down to, to a very similar level over time. And you, know, you, you will see that uh, cap rates do uh, ha have continued to impress very strongly in the past 12 months. Um, is that sustainable going forward? Uh, I think the question really depends on an asset by asset and what people forget when they're looking at property income yields is that the, the income is not fixed like in bonds. So the income will grow every year by structured rental growth or it might grow by inflation. So you can actually see yields increase with along with prices increasing. There's not a direct, uh, an inverse um, reaction always. On to the next slide, please. And then you can see that there's uh, the transaction volumes, as I mentioned earlier, despite the fact that borders are closed in Australia and New Zealand, we've seen very, very strong transactional activity uh, in uh, 2020 and the first part of 2021. And that's been across um, most of the major um, subsectors. Retail probably being the, the real lag out here. We haven't seen a lot of transaction amongst large shopping centres, but we've seen huge demand for logistics property and that's come globally. So we've seen uh, a very, very um, competitive processes which have attracted capital from Europe, North America and Asia into Australia. Uh, it's an Australian capital, some Asian capital coming into New Zealand also. But also uh, the office sector where you know, there's still that question mark about how much um, space will be required post COVID. And we've seen uh, very sophisticated groups coming out of Canada, out of uh, Asia, for example, Singapore, who have been paying pre-COVID pricing for, for quality assets in Australian markets. Next slide, please. Returns um, have really been driven by that cap rate compression over the past 12 months. So to use Kylie's uh, rugby analogy, uh, the, the All Blacks or the New Zealand has led the world uh, in real estate returns globally over the past 12 months. You can see that by the, the black diamond and we look at the grey diamond for all of these charts, you can see that returns over the last 12 months and almost all cases are higher than they were 
in the 12 months previous. So you know, you've seen it apart from the, the retail sector, you know, which uh, still is, is probably struggling to find its feet. Almost every other sector has been very, very strongly chased by investors um, with, with significant capital. Um, logistics globally has been the strongest performer. A lot of that's been through that cap rate compression and the anticipation of, of rental growth um, going forward. On to the next slide, please. And we'll just focus here on, uh, on logistics and um, e-commerce as a driver uh, for a few minutes here. So you can see there, this is for Australia. The New Zealand uh, slides are very, very similar. What, what you do see is that uh, e-commerce retail sales in, in Australia jumped by 44% um, in 2020. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a lot of the population uh, was in lockdown for extended periods of time. Uh, you did see a um, significant increase in e-commerce while people couldn't go out and physically shop, they were getting deliveries to their home. But it's part of a, a long-term trend. So that blue line there you can see is that uh, e-commerce as a percentage of total retail sales is still only about 13%, despite the fact that it's growing significantly by 44% uh, in the 12 months, it's still relatively low. Most sales are still through bricks and mortar. But if we look at markets globally, like the, the UK and the US, um, that, is, that figure is now over 20%. So that does imply that uh, e-commerce will remain a headwind to a lot of retail, uh, but retail will still have its, have its place, particularly for, for non-discretionary items. Um, what, what you can also see there is that uh, a lot of, through supply chain constraints, a lot of retailers have been moving to have more onshore goods uh, in warehouses. So it hasn't just been the e-commerce demand, it's been a lot of retailers who and suppliers have been building local um, supply chains, um, local fulfillment warehouses to take it, um, to really alleviate some of those bottlenecks uh, in ports and with, with shipments. So when we had once just in time, uh, back in the, in the 90s, uh, retailers are now moving towards a just in case type of inventory management system where they want to hold enough stock on hand in case they have supply chain issues. You can see that on the right, some of the, the major online platforms uh, in, in Australia and Amazon climbing up fairly strongly. Um, so it's now number three in Australia, but also the large supermarket groups very, very heavily represented there. On to the next slide, please. And I'll just uh, have a look quickly at uh, the future of, of the office markets. So obviously with people working from home, uh, a lot of tenants did not renew their full um, space requirements, no, their, their full leases when their, their leases came up. Uh, so a lot of tenants have been subletting space, uh, but it's been a lot less than we would have expected uh, 12 months ago. So the office vacancy in Australia has gone up to nearly 12% nationwide. Uh, but to put that in context, the, the vacancy was more than 20% in the, the 1990s. So you know, we've been here before, this is uh, not unprecedented levels by any means. What we've generally seen is a lot of um, occupiers have actually stayed put when their leases have expired. They might have handed back a floor or two, but they've kept, uh, they've generally stayed in, in position. And where they have been upgrading uh, or where they have been moving, they've been moving to higher quality uh, tenancies. So you can see there on that chart on the, the right that uh, as in almost all circumstances, the prime grade vacancies, the higher quality vacancy is lower than the, the secondary vacancy. And we, we generally see these kind of trends whenever vacancy levels are elevated, that tenants move from lower quality space, get a free upgrade moving into high quality space, paying similar rent levels or, or incentivized to, to do so. We're also seeing uh, a lot of corporates, particularly in the, the tech and finance space, who, who really want to incentivize their staff to come back to work. So that they are moving into new higher spec buildings, higher, um, uh, better located buildings and yeah, really trying to make that return to work experience very attractive to, to their staff. It's a very competitive market out there in the labor force. So they're using real estate as a, a means to try and uh, attract staff and maintain staff in quality buildings. Um, I'd also say that uh, post uh, COVID, the supply of new office buildings is very, very low. There's very little new development uh, taking place. So as the, the office markets do grow with um, GDP growth, and higher employment, then yeah, you know, we are seeing a lot of that vacancy starting to be taken up, particularly for the newer stock. I think we'll hand over to uh, come back to, to Kylie now for, for Q and A.
Thanks, uh, Patty, some really terrific insights there. And thanks, uh, Harry, for your session on defensive assets as well. Um, so we will come back to questions now. Hi, everybody. Um, so firstly, just a bit of a logistical one. There's a question here just asking if uh, you can get a copy of the slide. So yes, I believe when we send out the post webinar email with the replay, um, I'm sure we can include a copy of the slides there as well. Um, otherwise, there's a question here about uh, views on pricing of commodities on the back of our watching briefs. Um, I mean, I might make some comments and then Harry, feel, feel free to add something there. But um, as Harry said earlier, we don't tend to have direct exposure to uh, commodities within our portfolios, nor do we recommend it for our clients. We tend to capture that through uh, having exposure to the commodity producers or companies. But of course, you almost can't have a view on Australian equities, for example, without having some kind of view on commodities. And I think, you know, aligned with that sort of feeling reasonably positive about the ongoing uh, global recovery story and economic growth, although perhaps at more, more muted levels as we look forward, um, you know, I think we've got a, a reasonably favourable outlook for commodities um, coming through on the back of that, that growth story and the recovery story. Um, of course, if you um, are concerned about carbon levels in your portfolio or um, a, a carbon transition pathway, as we are for the Mercer funds, you need to be taking that into consideration as well with your commodity exposures and perhaps, uh, you know, just thinking about more targeted exposures or making sure that those factors are, are considered in your decision making. Harry, did you want to add anything on commodities? Yep, um, just a short one then. So there's the... Um long term and the short term, I guess, and as Kylie mentioned, in the long term, there is also the push to renewables to think about. Um, in the short term, I think, uh, apart from the cyclical recovery, which is positive, um, I, I you know, I think one of the reasons clients generally don't directly invest in commodities is that uh, there's a lot of politics involved, like you've seen Biden call out, you know, OPEC to increase production, and you've seen the uh, potential slowdown in China. And then I think last year during the uh, COVID crisis, we saw for example, Brent crude oil traded at 30% discount, uh, which is called containers. We actually had to pay up 30% extra just for holding oil. So it's very politically driven, which is why we in general do not recommend clients directly invest in commodities. Um, and apart from equities, we also have clients invested through commodity trading advice for managed, managed futures. So it's more like capturing the trend following premium. That, that's, that's okay, we think. Terrific. Thanks, Harry. A uh, few questions for you, Patty. Actually, a lot of interest in real estate. Um, so the first one is a little around sort of the listed versus unlisted real estate question and perhaps, um, you know, what that might be looking like in a relative sense at the moment, given pricing. Yeah, I think uh, post-COVID, we saw uh, listed real estate fall by more than the equity, broader equity market. Uh, and it, it languished uh, for some months, but there has been a pretty strong recovery in, in global REITs and Australian REITs. Uh, what we are seeing now is that a lot of the sectors in demand, so particularly logistics, uh, healthcare, uh, some of those more specialised sectors, uh, are trading at significant premiums to asset value, whereas the, the office uh, landlords, the large office landlords and the, um, the large retail landlords are still trading at quite large discounts to unlisted uh, valuations. So there's quite, quite a big uh, disconnect there. What we are seeing is a lot of take privates in the, the listed space. So a lot of private equity capital uh, is, is acquiring the smaller REITs, uh, particularly where they're trading at discounts, as are some of the larger REITs are actually uh, rolling up some of their, their smaller competitors. So it's been very active in that listed space, but it's a, a big disconnect between winners and losers in terms of valuations. Yeah, terrific. Um, I'm just going to stay with you for a moment, Paddy. So there's a question here about the um, so the continuation of the work from home environment and how that might impact commercial office demand. Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing really, Kylie, is that uh, a lot of occupiers, a lot of corporates really want to get their staff back to work at least a few days a week. Uh, that, you know, we're starting to see that globally now as, as a trend and they're trying to make their work, return to work experience as attractive as possible. So you know, what you are seeing is uh, a lot of uh, occupiers where they have to, where they decide to move, they're moving to, to higher quality buildings, better located, providing uh, good amenity to their staff. So, you know, close to convenience retail, close to transport and so on. 
and making that uh, office environment very, very attractive in terms of having a lot of breakout areas and collaboration areas and so on. So the way the offices are being used is, is different. Uh, they're actually generally taking more space per, pers per person uh, than there were previously. So we had this model prior to COVID where we're trying to get as many people into an office space as possible. There's now a focus on having more collaboration space. So that's really reducing the amount of space that uh, employers are giving back and uh, leases which are being broken. So I think it's really, again, a, a game of winners and losers. You, you want to be um, invested in, in high quality offices which are well located, plenty of natural light, plenty of good air circulation in locations which are attractive to employees. Thanks, um, Patty. Um, Harry, I might come over to you. Um, so just, uh, I guess, a question coming back to the defensive assets and some of those, uh, the, the zero income generating ones. Um, so you talked about crypto, although there wasn't much appetite for it at the moment amongst our uh, investors when we surveyed them. Um, mm -hmm. But what do you think if we were, if you were looking at a tail risk hedging strategy today, would you think that crypto or gold would do better? I would probably prefer gold. Um, if you look at what happened with cryptocurrencies during the COVID crisis, they actually think just as hard as the market. Um, apart from that also, I think, you know, I mean, gold has limited supply and it, it's sort of kept by central banks and people have liked for 5,000 years. I mean, it's really hard to be that, I think, to be honest. Crypto, I'm really not sure. I mean, we had a webinar on it last, I think in June, and um, I think it's like 10,000 currencies. Now it's, it's a bit hard to know which ones will survive. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Terrific, Harry. Um, there's a question here saying, um, sort of looking at that risk of correction. So saying historically, every time that the S&P 500 has doubled, there's been a, a correction. This time might be different, um, but then it's sort of asking about the, the impacts on super funds and peer relative performance. Um, so I guess the first thing I'd say about that is, you know, certainly some risk in there of getting some correction come after the markets have been so strong, so not um, intending to underplay that. I think the bigger drivers of peer relative performance amongst super funds are not necessarily the exposure, how much exposure they've got to the US equity markets. I think it tends to come in a little bit more around uh, exposure to listed assets versus unlisted assets, currency hedging ratios can be can be a pretty big one and then obviously your growth defensive mix or the types of assets that you've got within your growth defensive mix probably the bigger drivers of peer relative performance i'd say in australia for um superannuation funds rather than the s p or, or the us equity market uh exposures um we've got one minute to go so i must might just um slip in another question here um there are quite a lot on real estate so i might come back um to you Patty, um, and if we might pick up some of these other questions that we're not going to get to in future uh, future webinars. So um, there was a question here, Patty, talking about um, how the real estate equity managers are doing on ESG matters such as modern slavery and transition to net zero. Uh, thank you, Kylie. Um, yeah, I think this, particularly net zero has been a focus of the uh, property managers for quite some time. Uh, pretty happy to say that a number of our investments in Australia are already net zero, uh, particularly in the in the office space, with the the balance expected to be net zero uh, well before 2030. So a lot of progress um, on on net zero targets. Modern slavery uh, again, the, the Australian industry uh, has been very uh, forth, has been on the front foot with this. The Property Council of Australia does have a a database uh, where. Um, office landlords are actually logging their supply chains and there's a lot of uh, um, research into um, modern slavery issues within those supply chains. So to try to make, make sure that we're very much in the front foot in terms of responding to E, S and G with the asset class. Very good. Well, thank you everyone. We are out of time. Um, thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but we will try to capture them uh, and make sure we pick them up in, in planning for future uh, events. A uh, big thank you to our speakers today. Thanks for joining us, Patty and Harry. Um, remember, if you can just respond to the post-webinar survey, that'd be absolutely terrific. And we really hope that we see you again next time. Thank you for your time today.